to the Q2 FY24 earnings conference call of Nuama Wealth Management Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then 0 on your touchstone phone. Please note that this call is being recorded. I now run the conference over to Mr. Ashish Kehar, MD and CEO. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon uh, and a very warm welcome to all of you for joining the maiden earnings call of Novama. Uh, we've already uploaded the presentation and the data book and uh, on our website and the stock exchanges. Uh, I think we'll keep uh, receiving feedback from you on the data book and keep enriching it over a period of time. I know you'll have multiple questions. We'll try to answer them over the call and also over a period of time improve the data book. Joining me today in the call uh, are my colleagues Mihir. Mihir Manavati is the CFO. Manish Danuka is the head of investor relations and uh, uh, the SGA team. Uh, we thought it would be appropriate that since it's our first call, uh, instead of jumping directly into the earnings and the performance of the quarter, we'll give you a brief uh, introduction and overview of Nuama, how uh, it came into existence and what are the businesses we are into. And then perhaps we can take us through the performance of the current period and then we'll move into the Q&A section. Uh, so as you know that this, this business was actually a part of Edelweiss uh, till about 2021. And that's when uh, PAG came in as a majority shareholder. Uh, it was a controlled transaction. And we, uh, it was with the intention that we will demerge the company and list it over a period of time, which we've concluded over the last two years. The businesses uh, will sit inside the mama. Uh, essentially, largest is wealth management. And I'll talk a bit about it. Uh, if you look at wealth management as an industry in India, uh, and if you look at the overall client pyramid or client triangle, the bottom of the pyramid is the retail or the mass retail segment. And our view is that that is best handled by banks or maybe brokers and fintech companies because the profit pools in those customers are not substantial enough for specialized wealth management firms to you know derive value. To derive value from those customers, you have to actually access the whole wallet which includes their banking products, credit cards, home loans, etc. And the needs of the customers are also relatively simple. I mean, they are in the lowest tax bracket, so maybe a bank deposit or a simple insurance product can solve their problem. But as the customers, you know, become more affluent, as they move up into the second tier of the pyramid, uh, which we typically call affluent and HNI, that's when things start becoming a bit more interesting. Uh, because the customer moves into higher tax brackets, their needs are no longer, uh, you know, met by the simple fixed deposits because they pay higher taxes. They want to invest in uh, diversified products and have a diversified portfolio. But unfortunately, that becomes a structural challenge for banks because it competes with their liability franchise. While they do offer what they offer, uh, but because of this conflict with the liability franchise, you will see that uh, most of the banks typically, uh, more often than not, have more uh, bent towards uh, selling insurance. And that's when uh, players like us can step in. And this is the opportunity we saw 10 years back. Uh, we did a lot of market research and market study in these customer segments across the country, tier one, tier two, tier three down. And there was a common feedback which kept coming back from clients that they need unbiased advice from, uh, from their wealth managers. They need to have a diversified portfolio so that over a period of time, they can build financial independence. And that was what triggered us to start this uh, part of the segment uh, more than 10 years back. I think we've had, we've had a reasonable head start here. We have about 900 RMs in this segment, extremely profitable, spread across uh, 65 to 70 locations. And we work both with our internal RMs and external wealth managers. About 25% of our business you know, actually comes from external wealth managers. We have a full-fledged platform, complete product basket, uh, which includes investments, lending, exchange traded products, and even uh, making of will and stuff like that to holistically cater to this segment. 
Uh, I don't think there are too many players uh, which compete with us, although we are seeing a lot of interest now coming into this segment, but we've developed a reasonable leadership here. Then moving up further into the top end of the segment, which is typically called ultra H9, which is about uh, 25 crore plus. Anything below 25 crore is what we fit in the affluent and HNI segment. It can start from 1 to 2 crores, some may start from 5 crores, but broadly below 25 crores because that cohort has a cluster of needs which can be met by these type of people. Ultra H9 segment is slightly different, <coughs> far more bespoke, complex needs. Investment, uh, I think, just forms 25-30% of their needs. They have businesses uh, where they need advice. I'm uh, sorry to interrupt, sir. This is the operator. Can you come closer to the microphone, please? I am actually very close. No problem. I'll try to speak louder. Yeah, yeah please go ahead. Uh, yeah. So, uh, the ultra and segment actually has needs which are far more bespoke, I was saying. Investment needs are just one of them. Uh, they need uh, wealth structuring, estate planning. They have businesses in multiple countries. So I think a lot of things have to come together. And uh, that was the focus again here for us to build a platform which can comprehensively solve the needs of this segment. And we fortunately also have an investment bank inside Novama. So it can help in uh, working with these promoters and solving their business needs. So combined these two, uh, both Ultra HNI, which is we, we, which is we brand as Novama Private, and Affluent and HNI, which we brand as Novama Wealth, is the wealth management cluster. This contributes about 70% of the revenue and about 70% of the profits of Novama uh, in general. It was, so when we started uh, in 2001, when PAG came in, uh, the revenues of this segment was about 480 crores. Uh, in FY23, we crossed 1000 crores, so we've almost doubled the revenue. And profit contribution moved from about 20-25% to about 70% in this segment. Uh, in the ultra H9 segment, uh, the limiting factor across the world, and I would not say limiting factor, I would say the raw material is the RM and uh, given the fact that these are people who deal with extremely sophisticated customers with sophisticated needs, you always uh, have them in short supply and the only way you can actually crack and create a moat in this segment is to build a platform where the RM is able to monetize and add value to the clients more than anywhere else. And that is the focus because the, the relationship managers and the clients, they, they are actually common across all platforms. Uh, the differentiating factor is what does your platform give which allows the RM to deliver more services to your clients and make more money. And I think that is the focus which we have uh, used to develop the platform. And happy to say that we are one of, one of the most comprehensive platforms in the country. We have about 115 RMs in this segment. And uh, as I said, about 900 uh, in the affluent and HNI. The second business which we have in Novama is asset management. Uh, this is the newest business which we started after uh, we became independent. It's about two years old now. And uh, it works extremely synergistically with the wealth management part because uh, the wealth management actually has the customer insights and defines what product needs uh, customers have. And there is a gap in the market, which is what we create. Uh, over the last two years, we've built about 6,200 crores of AUM uh, divided into two large buckets of strategies. One is private equity. In private equity, we have a market leadership product, which is, uh, which is called crossover or pre-IPO. And we recently launched a venture debt fund, which is adjacent to that. Combined these two, I think the asset would be around uh, 4,800, 4,900 crores. Uh, then we also started a uh, listed of the public equity segment in which uh, the first product which we launched was a hedge fund, long shot, uh, more equity oriented. Uh, that's now second largest in its category. And we are soon going to launch a gift city version, which has tax advantages both for institutional investors, uh, overseas institutional investors, and NRIs. Uh, in addition to that, after the tax rate change for MFs, insurance, and MLD, we started an absolute return product, which targets about 7 to 8% net of tax. We see that that is a clear gap now in the market because there is no other default fixed income product where uh, uh, Alpha HNIs can pass their money. I think combination of this exists. Uh, future, the way we are thinking is to solve for yield. And the two, three products which are in the pipeline are real assets like commercial real estate and private credit. We are in the process of building and hiring teams. And maybe in the next six to 12 months, 
they should hit the market with these products. Uh, the third business uh, which exists in Noama, which in fact is the oldest business of Illinois, which is capital markets, which has institutional equities, investment banking, and custody and clearing business. Uh, let me first talk about custody and clearing because again, I think that is unique to us because only banks typically offer that service. We are one of the few, uh, actually one of the three non-banks uh, which have the license to offer custody services. So it's actually a very prized asset. Uh, we handle clients which are FPIs and domestic PMSs and AIFs. Large part of the business comes from FPIs. It's a very niche offering uh, directed towards uh, hedge funds and quant funds and high frequency trading companies. Some of the largest uh, ones are our clients in that business. And the business is extremely simple. You provide them custody and clearing services, not too volatile. Uh, it's like a hammer and tongs business and we uh, grow at a consistent pace with the rise of the trading volumes in the country and the institutional participation uh, which comes into the country. Uh, institutional equities investment banking, I think that is the most uh, uh, understood business uh, by our community. We are we have market leadership in institutional equities. We have about 5.4 percent market share. Uh, number two in the domestic broker side and investment banking. We offer a full service, uh, which is ECM, BCM, uh, and m and and private equity. Both of these now uh, actually we are working very very closely, and maybe in next three four quarters we'll also start publishing data on how we are building synergy with the wealth management side. Because both these businesses work extremely close with the promoter community and each of them are potential wealth management clients. In fact, uh, in 2022-23, uh, more than 30% of the relevant investment banking clients which we onboarded became wealth management clients. And similarly, now we are working actively with the institutional equities team. Uh, so the objective actually is to create a one Novama kind of a structure where the customer can enter in any part of the circle. They can enter into asset management. They can enter into wealth management, and then we we basically use the whole platform to add value and try to monetize the client. Uh, I mean, I could just give a simple example. Uh, we could invest from a pre-IPO fund into a company. When it goes public, we could use our investment bank to offer the services to them, and when the promoter actually gets the money, uh, we can use our ultra HNI proposition to make the promoter our client and we can use our affluent and HNI proposition to make the employees our clients. So this is the entire objective to build this full ecosystem and create one Nuama. Uh, I think that's where we are today. Uh, revenues over the last three years at a platform level have moved from about 1000 to 1600 crores. I'm talking FI23 numbers and profits have nearly doubled. Uh, I think with that, I will hand over to me to give you a, a quick overview of the current period performance and then maybe we could move on to the questions that you have. Mihir, over to you. Thank you, Ashish. Uh, and uh, warm welcome to all of you once again. Uh, as we move ahead in our journey as listed entity, we look forward to deepening our engagement with you further. Now over to our operational and financial, most recent operational and financial performance. It's why 24 H1 uh, started on a, has been a positive uh, for us as we have reported a growth on most of our operating enterprises over corresponding previous quarter and half year periods. Uh, to, begin, to begin with, on our uh, client assets, our client assets is on quarter end, the two like 89,000 to 81 crore showed a year-on-year -year growth of 26%. Of this, client assets of our wealth management business stood at 217,278 crores, a YOY growth of 21%. Asset management business, uh, AUM stood at 6,175 crores, uh, compared to 4,300 odd crores as on the September of SI 23, uh, reporting a year-on-year -year growth of 43%. Our client assets in our clearing and custody service business stood at 65,828 crores, a year-on-year -year growth of 47%. Now to our revenues. Our total revenue for Q2 FY24 stood at 492 crores, grew by 29% year-on-year. Our revenues for uh, half-year FY24 were at 909 crores and grew by 24% year-on-year. Of, of this, our wealth business revenue was 281 crores for the quarter and grew at 16% year-on-year year over a previous quarter. 
for half year FY24, the wealth revenues were 553 crores and grew by 17% year on year over September FY23. Our asset management uh, business reported revenue of rupees 19 crore uh, for Q2 FY24 and rupees 32 crore for H1 FY24. Excluding the carry component, the revenue was uh, rupees 11 crore for uh, quarter 2 FY24 and grew by 17% year on year. Similarly, X carry revenue for uh, September 24 half year were rupees 24 crore. And, report, and that resulted in a year-on-year -year growth of 24%, 42% over previous uh, half year. Our capital markets revenues were uh, 190 crores, uh, which grew 86% year-on-year. And for H1 FI24, the revenues were 320 crore and grew by 51% year-on-year over H1 FI23. I'd just like to pause here and touch upon an impact uh, that SEBI circular uh, on distribution fees on AIs on our wealth management business revenues. The SEBI circular of May, uh, circular of May 23 on AIs commission kept charging of upfront, upfront commission on AIs to a maximum of one third of total commission. And the balance uh, would be recovered over the life of the funds. This change resulted in lower revenue booking in FY24 Q2 over corresponding uh, quarter or of FY23 on a like to like basis. Had we not, uh, had this change not materialized, our growth in wealth management revenue for the current quarter would have been approximately 30% uh, higher uh, as against the reported growth of 16% over the same period. We may, however, mention that this impact is transitional and would result in a higher trail income in the following periods. This is just to give a context to our wealth revenue growth, um, as, as stating that, look, uh, our volumes are intact, our business is intact, the numbers are impacted by the change in the income booking pattern. On the uh, cost side, the total cost for uh, Q2 FY24 stood at 302 crore and grew by 16% year on year. For half year FY24, the cost were 594 crore and grew by 12% year on year. Of these, the staff cost amounted to 212 crore in quarter two uh, of FY24 and grew by 17% year on year. Uh, for a current half, uh, the state cost was 421 crore uh, and grew by 14% year on year. Our operating expenses, were 90 crore in Q2 of FI24 and grew by 14% year on year. Whereas the for the half year of FI24 current half, 170 uh, cost was 173 crore and grew by 8% year on year. Coming to our uh, profitability, our operating pad for Q FI24 stood at rupees 145 crore and grew from 93 crore. Uh, it, in uh, Q2 FY23, reporting a growth of 57% on year on year basis. Our operating profit for H1 FY24 is to 244 crore, showing a growth of 63% a year on year. Our return equities uh, for the half year ended uh, September 23 is to 20.3%, up 5.47% over the same period of uh, last year. Our cost to income ratio for half year was 65%, current half was 65%, and uh, was lowered by 7.0% 7 .0 over last year of September 23. Here, we would also like to mention the adjustments. You would all have seen the data book, and we would like, you, like to explain a couple of points uh, that uh, reflect in our data book. The adjustments that we have made to our operating profits as Ashish explained, uh, Nuama Group uh, got carved out of Edelweiss Group uh, over a two-year uh, uh, from FY21 to FY23. And to attain current holding business and NGD structures, uh, a number of arrangements, uh, including that through demerger schemes, were put in place. This resulted in a number of exceptional items and non-recurring items reflect getting reflected in the financial statements. And to make current results comparable with that of past periods, and also to set the reference point for comparing future performances, we made two key adjustments to the reported numbers. 
the first is to uh, is the carving and carve out of income and expenses uh, there are two components again here uh, the part of uh, investment banking uh, business came to us uh, through a demerger scheme in uh, get, which got approved in may 2023 we were entitled to uh, the profits from uh, these business over a period of fy22 till the date of merger now that lumpy uh, income net of uh, lumpy profit element came in q uh, current uh, previous quarter that means june of 2023 june first quarter of current financial year we what we have done in order to make the numbers comparable we have actually carved out from uh, quarter 1 and reappropriated those numbers into the previous years as as they became, as they were applicable similarly in fy21 carve out represent income and expenses of business and businesses and entities which were which were transferred to efsl group as a part of restructuring uh, resulting in what we have mainly capital market business wealth management business and asset management business second adjustments pertain to uh, the adjustments of uh, carving out or adjusting the non recurring expenses uh, as we separated out from advice group as an independent entity or group we incur significant amount of expenses towards uh, transition uh, which includes uh, platform transition technology transition or brand transition and so on and forth and we also incurred uh, significant expenses on the merger and listing of our entities these expenses uh, were incurred between fy21 and last uh, uh, previous quarter of the current year and we have adjusted the respect these expenses uh, from the respective periods uh, to reflect the operating profit important to say that uh, current quarter <coughs> numbers do not have any uh, carving carve out adjustments or the extraordinary adjustment uh, adjustments for any extraordinary ordinary or non recurring expenses so from here on we are on like uh, you know steady state basis all of these elements have been granularly quali- uh, quantified uh, into in our cpt as well as data book for clarity and analysis purposes uh, that's all from my side and i request the moderator to take over and initiate post- uh, question answer session Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchtone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. We have our first question from the line of Dipanjan Ghosh from City. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, good morning, sir. Firstly, uh, congratulations for the listing. Uh, just a few questions from my side. Um, first, you know, on your managed products in the wealth division, both on private and Novama Wealth, uh, if you can just give some split either on the AUM side or on, on the revenue side between the product mix that you have, and uh, I think on your. Sorry, I I lost him. Uh, are you guys able to hear him, Mr. Ghosh? We are unable to hear you. Should we move to the next question, sir? Yeah. We'll check his connection. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We have a question from the line of Jagannathan Tonu Guntla from Tech Pro Ventures. Please go ahead. Hi, congratulations on listing and uh, stellar uh, operating performance. uh i hope you can hear me yeah yeah we can a uh, couple of queries one is uh, uh is it uh, the in comparison to q1 and q2 performance the expenses and the salaries etc appearing to be uh, lower as a percentage of the revenue is it to do with the q1 has more bonus element and uh, so on i'm trying to understand so that there will be a uh seasonality um, element on the q1 uh actually no now uh, uh, if you look at last year uh, our bonus provisioning was not as smooth uh, because we were still uh, adapting but this year onwards our bonus and incentive provisioning is uh, in line with the revenues the reduction in the 
cost income actually has come because of the improved performance on the revenue side. Uh, I don't think there is a severe movement on the cost side in that sense. Uh, why I'm asking is uh, the um, uh, so employee cost more or less remains the same between Q1 and Q2, um, and whereas revenue obviously yeah. more. So it's more of uh, you can say operating leverage playing out and efficiency is playing out. Is it to do with that? Yes, the, I think that is the correct assessment. It is operating leverage which is playing out, and also uh, in Q2 we've had uh, a little bit of carry coming in, about eight crores of carry coming in. And uh, the performance of the capital market uh, segment is uh, significantly superior than Q1, uh, which may slightly moderate in the uh, balance period of the year. But I don't think you will see significant movement in the employee cost or the OPEX uh, from the levels which you are seeing. It will trend upwards mildly, but not significantly. This. Correct. So other point is uh, just to, uh, just to get, to get the clarity on the uh, asset side. You said client asset is two lakh seventeen, uh, and uh, so adding that sixty thousand sixty five thousand crores of client assets, that's what you are referring to, right? Two lakh ninety thousand. Uh, so basically, if you look at the client assets, the total is around two lakh eighty five, two lakh eighty nine. Uh, wealth management is divided into two uh, buckets. One is Dumama Private. Second is Nuwama Wealth. Nuwama Private is around 150 range. Uh, Nuwama Wealth is about 65,000. Asset management is 6,200, and custody and clearing is 65,000. So if you add everything together, it gets to the 280 range. Okay. Just last point. So comparing it with the FI23 figure that you had given in the historical trend. Um, so FI23 you had uh, shown a figure of 231,000 crores. Absolutely. So the 231,000 crore has grown to 285,000. It's collecting Yes, that's right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. We have a question from Dipanjan Ghosh from City. Please go ahead. Uh, hi. Uh, am I audible this time? Yes, yes, Dipanjan, you are. Yeah, hi. So I'll just repeat my questions. Uh, first, you know, on your wealth division, I uh, just wanted to get some color on the managed products, uh, both on the private side and on the wealth side. And on the you know private side, you have given the mix between recurring and non-recurring. Uh, if you could give give us give us some color on the similar piece for the uh, for the wealth division for your MPIS uh, piece specifically, that that would be my first question. Uh, second uh, would be on PNL reconciliation. Uh, you, while you state a core or adjusted revenue number out there of around uh, 909 crores for first half, just wanted to get some sense of where does interest income and net gain on fair value change really sit within that? Because in your segmental revenues, you uh, you have not uh, you know, explicitly carved out the uh, other income or the volatile part of the uh, or, or the investment link part of the uh, revenues out there. And third, uh, you know, on your cost trajectory, if you can give some color on how do you see that shaping up from here onwards in terms of both business or franchisee or RM expansion and also productivity improvement across the RMs that is available out there. So these will be my three questions. I have two data keeping questions, but I can uh, maybe, maybe ask at the end. So first, uh, managed products and investment solutions uh, or managed products in that sense, the Panjan is uh, largely the same split as the industry. I mean, it will have uh, mutual funds, PMS, AIF uh, in case of private. And in case of Nuwama Wealth, uh, we also had insurance, although that's a very small component. Uh, in terms of uh, Nuwama Wealth recurring and non-recurring revenue at an overall level, although I have always maintained in the past that we don't track that business on that basis. Uh, we normally look at the yield on the overall assets, which is about 1%. But if you look at the derived total income uh, of recurring and non-recurring, uh, about 50 odd percent of 49, 45 to 50% is still coming as recurring, uh, even in Nuwama Wealth. Uh, your second question was on the uh, net interest income. Uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on the other income. So basically, uh, you know, in your BAC release, you tend to mention interest income, net gain on fair value change, etc., other income separately. But uh, in your uh, MIS reporting uh, for the seg data for the segments like private wealth, AMC, you seem to have clubbed that within the businesses, or maybe you have kind of adjusted that uh, in the PNL reconciliation. So just wanted to get that triangulation math. Yeah, so net interest income is largely split between Noama Wealth and Noama Private. 
because those are the two businesses which have net uh, interest income uh, because of the client uh, loan books which sit there. And uh, in Nuama uh, private, the net interest income for half year would be around 32 crores. And in Nuama wealth, it will be around uh, 82 crores. Uh, on the other income side, uh, Mehir, you want to take a shot? So on the other income, uh, again, um, the accounting component of other income is uh, purely uh, uh, relating to uh, income tax refunds and stuff like that, or non-business uh, non income, but they've got apportioned uh, in appropriate manner to the extent they relate to the businesses. Got it. So j just me, just to follow up, I mean, so would you, so like for the first half, your um, you know, net gain on fair value change is let's say 142 crores. So does this entire 909 crores capture this? I mean, does the 142 sit within the 909? Yes, yes, yes. yes. So when I say when Ashish yeah. said NII, it covers every element. Uh, it would appropriately get captured either as a part of NII or a bond trade uh, positions or, a, uh, you know, security trade positions either into uh, wealth management business or in our capital market business, which uh, has, uh, you know, debt, uh, debt capital market division, which takes uh, trade positions uh, uh, from, uh, you know, short duration trade position for the client facilitation. I'll just Sorry. add, Dipanjan, there that uh, typically gets classified uh, in distribution income. What Mir is trying to explain that uh, in, in two, three categories where, uh, let's say, fixed income secondary, or in unlisted securities, it actually passes through the books. So you first buy and then you sell down to clients and the spread income is what you make, which in MIS gets classified as distribution income in either Nuama Private or Nuama Wealth. But in your accounting, it comes as net uh, gain on fair value changes and all that. Uh, a very small portion will sit in the capital markets where they do this uh, when they do the debt syndication business. Got it, got it, got it. Uh, on the third part, on the cost part, if you can give some color. So cost broadly OPEX, uh, if you look at the first two quarters, 84 and 90, 90 has uh, uh, some five crores of one time, which is related to listing, which will go off. So we will start uh, Q3 on a base of around 85, 86 crores. And uh, we don't see quarter on quarter movement of more than 2-3% there. Uh, in terms of uh, fixed uh, and variable cost on manpower, I think uh, uh, broadly the addition will be in line with, as we have seen between Q1 and Q2, uh, as we add RMs, but it will not be disproportionate. Uh, I mean, again, not more than 2-3% a quarter uh, at max. Uh, just a few data keeping questions. Uh, first is, you know, what what does held away assets really mean? And uh, second would be, what is the yeah, Sorry, yeah, please, please. Go. Yeah, I'll, I, I'll just answer that. So basically, uh, what happens, Dipanjan, when you onboard uh, clients in the Ultra HNI segment, uh, it's not necessary that you will get their entire assets or or what they want to park with you or through you, everything together. And there are times when they will say that, look, I hold this outside. Why don't you give advice to me even on this or tell me what should I do? And they start sharing that data, which we start capturing in our system. The objective is that over a period of time, if you are able to deliver value to those clients on those assets, they start moving from held away to your own. Got it. Got it. But, 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 but theoretically, as on this date, they are not a part of yes. Obama's yes. managed assets. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, just a few more, two, two, one or two small questions. One is, uh, again, the difference between, uh, so, yeah, what is the difference between fee paying AUM and uh, closing AUM uh, in the asset uh, management piece? Um, uh, so, Dipanjan, uh, when you do a product which has, uh, they, when you do a private equity product or a venture tech product, uh, there are, uh, or let's say even a credit fund or a commercial real estate fund, uh, which are essentially category 2 AIFs. Uh, which are drawdown based, the fee charging model can be of two types. One is you can charge on commitment, and second is when you charge only on drawdown. Typically, okay. products which are a fixed income type delivery, uh, the industry charges on drawdown and not on commitment, otherwise the client returns gets compromised. So the gap between, let's say, uh, 4,800, 4,900, that full cluster, uh, minus what you see as fee paying is the undrawn amount which will get drawn in the next, let's say, 12 to 15 months.
got uh, just one last question uh, on the net new money now uh, you know since you have given just one number i would assume that it would also include a lot of volatility from the transaction of the broking piece which kind of goes in and goes out because if i look at your movement of net new money i mean for example in private you have a, a significant amount of uh, outflows uh, and novama wealth also i mean the if i compare quarter on quarter or last year trends i think it has dropped so x of the transaction i mean if you can just give some color on the money or the other core flows that is coming in from clients in the managed products um, or in the amc on some of the products if you can give give some color on that yeah so if you look at novama private uh, the first half uh, net new money on a total basis is about uh, 1200 crores but if you if you see uh, the arr and transactional assets that's about 4700 crores out of that around 80% is arr uh, and uh, again wow wealth we don't track it in this manner it's largely uh, you know managed products and investment solutions uh, in 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 the transactional assets or the brokerage assets the movement is relatively small it's more uh, to do with the uh, uh, mtm there Uh, but to be precise the total movement uh, in h1 in the broking assets is about 61 crores out of the 3700 crores of net new money in one of it uh sorry ashish can you just repeat the private portion if i understood so correctly out of your uh, 1200 crores of so, money so movement to 1200 crores there is a positive of 4700 which is the assets with us and held away is reduced by the rest so the outflow is more from the held away assets and not from the assets which we have got it so this for, for, uh, 4700 crores is the net positive this net is positive yes this will include broking uh, broke money going into broking also right i mean um, yeah this will include and broking would be about broking is again an outflow of 1000 crores Okay. Okay. So, so basically, around fifty seven hundred crores of net new money in your MPIS yes, project. Yes. That's right. That's right. Got it. And and why why did you specifically carve out the expenses which are mapped to revenues as in um, on both sides which are mirrored specifically on your uh, reconciliation? Uh, I mean, do you give uh, what would be the sub broker payout or some color on that model on that part of the business? That would be my last question. Yes, I request you to join back the queue, sir. Ah, uh, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. We have a next question from the line of Mohit from BOP Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, congratulations on listing, and I've got two three questions. First is that I wanted to understand your strategy whether you would be targeting HNI or UHNI. Uh, the typical yields that you earn in the HNI and the UHNI segment, and some color on the attrition if if you could give both on the client and the RM side. So if you uh, actually if you look at the numbers in the data board, it will be reasonably clear. In the private segment, our ARR yield is around one uh, percent, and on the transactional revenue, we make about fifty crores a quarter. And if you take if in that fifty, about twenty five comes from uh, let's say twenty crores comes from broking, and rest comes from non broking. So non broking yield on the on the full base would be around thirty twenty thirty basis points. And one percent on overall assets. On Noama Wealth, our yield on overall assets is about one one point one percent. So that's on the yield side. What was your second question? So on the, on the attrition, if you could throw some some color, basically both on RM and the client uh, side. What was the attrition that you experienced over the last two three years? So in Noama Private, we've lost about three people. Regret attrition and uh, Noama Wealth, the attrition regret attrition is about one and a half to two percent. customer attrition uh, very frankly doesn't happen in our businesses uh, this is a question i've been asked many number of times and i've explained that customer attrition actually means customer closing accounts and going away that's sub 1% across the board typically happens when people move out of the country or they are closing the full relationship it doesn't really typically happen there all right and basically your strategy you know that you would focus more on the uhni or the hni mass shifted i mean what would be your strategy going forward which piece you will focus more within the wealth our our view is very clear uh, you really need to focus on both because if you look at the stage at which we are uh, in wealth management business in india it's extremely nascent it's not like a fully developed business where you have to you know it become extremely sharp in targeting i think uh, pieces are expanding 
Uh, as of today, both Ultra HNI and HNI and Affluent have become extremely profitable as client segments. Uh, most players have tapped uh, tier one and maybe tier two, tier three, tier four. Uh, there is significant amount of wealth creation that has happened. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, to be very candid, whenever any of us visits tier two, tier three towns, it's an opportunity sitting there where wealth and clients are actually growing at a pace far faster than the pace at which industry is adding RMs. Okay. So I, I don't think we are at a stage right now where you need to diversify your focus. Both offer opportunities because at the back end, there is tremendous amount of synergies, right? Asset classes are similar. Product construct may change. There may be different, uh, you know, personalizations and specializations you will build at the margin. But you are significantly able to leverage the same infrastructure to target both the customer segments. There is no point in right now saying I will focus here more or focus there less. As a firm, we will focus on wealth and asset management more. That's the stated strategy. Right. You know that this is helpful. So, so next question is on the revenues. I think from Q3 onwards, is it safe to assume that all your revenues would be in the trail mode and there will be no upfront uh, uh, recording there? Uh, so there are b uh, product categories. Now in uh, AIFs, there is a methodology now prescribed by SEBI, uh, which is what we are following in mutual funds and PMS. That was done a couple of years back. Uh, let's say a products like fixed income and structures and unlisted, they will always remain on a transactional basis for every player in the industry because there is no method by which you can make them trail giving. When you sell a fixed income, you earn at that point in time and the accounting rules uh, have, have basically made it mandatory that you have to recognize the income at that point in time. So those will remain as transactional. The proportion of transactional will keep coming down over a period of time, but they will always remain transactional. Perfect. My last question is, is on the employee expenses. So variable cost is around 30 to 33% of total employee expenses. Will it remain in that range going forward? Uh, yeah, we don't really see too much changing there uh, because incentives are linked to typically revenues. It could change uh, only if we have a dramatic increase in revenues. Then yes, the variable cost component will change, uh, but then profitability will also rise. Right. Uh, perfect. Thanks and wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. We have a next question from the line of Abhijit Sakre from Kotak Securities. Please go ahead. Mr. Yeah, can yeah, hi. Good morning. Go uh, sir, uh, to start off, I had a few clarifications on the Nuama Wealth business. So if you could uh, just give some color on uh, what do you mean by MPIS? Like, which are the products you're including here? Uh, so typically, first category, uh, Abhijit, is managed products. And managed products has four segments. Alternative investment funds, mutual funds, portfolio management service, and insurance. And then uh, beyond that, you have uh, products which are ex of exchange traded. So your fixed income, uh, MLDs, uh, unlisted securities, all those also come in the investment solution. So combination of these two is we call managed products and investment solutions. So virtually you can say everything other than uh, direct equity uh, or currency or commodity mm -hmm. sits here. Okay, because uh, when I look at the yields, the implied yields are almost 2%, which uh, looks higher uh, for at least the investment funds uh, part of the business. So I'm guessing the 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 higher uh, yields is driven by, you know, products like MLDs and some of the other ones that you mentioned. So MLDs, uh, so typically the yield on gross sales here would be in the range of 25 to 3.5%. Only insurance is more, but insurance is a component for us, even in this business. Uh, right. If I look at an estimate of full year basis, will not right. be more than 8-9% uh, of the revenues. Uh, but that also bumps up the yield a bit. But yes, 25 to 3% is what you typically are able to make if you do fixed income or MLDs or, uh, or, uh, or, or you know, unlisted securities. Understood. Mm -hmm. And then uh, second one, uh, the client asset composition, almost 60-65% is uh, classified as others. So. There again, if you could give some broad breakups, would be helpful. Uh, actually, we'll start sharing this over a period of time. So about 35% will be managed products and investment solutions, and that is growing at a very, very fast pace. 
uh, what this this you are asking only Nuama Wealth right now? Yeah, yeah, Nuama Wealth. Uh, others, which was sixty three percent in first half. Uh, so that would have let's say some brokerage asset and some uh, other unlisted securities and all that sitting there. Uh, but from a component perspective, that is now dropping. Except if you know mark to market happens, that we can't help. Understood. Um, and then the second one uh, on the wealth business, um, the impact of AIF change in uh, um, the recognition of fees. Uh, if you could share the uh, absolute amount of assets with upfront income and the associated uh, fee amount that was booked, uh, let's say last full year, or the, I think the the regulation changed only in the second quarter this year, right? So if you could at least give the last full year, okay. what the number would be. First of May is when the regulation actually changed. Uh, hmm. In favor, in basically, it essentially changed from uh, uh, booking upfront, and we were actually not on full upfront, uh, Abhijit. We were around 60%, and that has now fallen. So, if I look at the revenues, that would have actually we've done a computation on what would have been the incremental revenues had we not changed. Uh, for let's say this half year, it would be around 40 to 50 crores more uh, in the mm -hmm. full wealth cluster if we had continued with the last year's uh, uh, booking methodology. And any uh, quantification of the amount of assets itself? Am amount of assets, uh, I think this year we would have sold around 2,000, 2,200 crores. Okay. Okay. All right. And the last one is asset servicing business. Uh, how to look at the revenue driver? Is it the, the jump? Is it driven by interest rates? Uh, do we get client money where we earn float? Is, is that true? Yes, that's right. The combination of two things, actually, uh, assets under clearing. Uh, so there are two uh, ways in which you can look. And I think uh, we've also deliberated this internally. And uh, we will modify and update the data book to help you understand more. Uh, uh, essentially, there are two buckets in which assets are divided there. One is assets under custody, and second is assets under clearing. Uh, in that 65,000, the assets are broken in these two categories. Assets under custody, actually, the revenue doesn't uh, come here directly. Uh, it, it It's taken as a profit pickup. Uh, because it's a it's a entity which is an associate entity. Assets under clearing is what you should see, and the revenue is reflective. So around between 1% to 1.5% because within assets under clearing, there is uh, float assets and non-float assets. On non -flow, on the overall, you earn some fees and some transaction charges and fund accounting charges, which are all annual in nature. And on float, you earn the interest income. So combination is between 1% to 1.5% is what we have for a full year basis. Understood. Thanks a lot. And thanks a lot for the disclosures. Thank you. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Manan Polaria from MKP Securities. Please go ahead. Hello. Hi, sir. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, you are. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if this is a repeat question. I've been listening to the call. I don't think it is, but I'll go ahead and see the way. So my question is with respect to the Nuama private revenues. Uh, we've seen an 8-9% jump this year, but uh, this quarter, but we are not uh, seeing that same in terms of profitability. What I want to understand is, is it that our RMs are, we have overhired currently and we are going to, get, we are planning to get to that kind of revenue later where this cost is uh, year on year going to be attractive to our bottom line or uh, what is the case? I'd just like to understand. So I think one, uh, what you're saying is correct. We have added about uh, 15 RMs uh, and their productivity will flow through uh, in the next 12 to 18 months. Second uh, is that we were describing that uh, there is a change in accounting that has happened in how we recognize income from AIFs, uh, specifically Category 2 AIFs, which earlier we were recognizing about 60% upfront and balance in trade. That has now changed to about 30%, which comes in year one and balance in trade. So there is an impact of about 30 crores, 35 crores, 30 crores in Noama private specifically because of this change. And so if you add that back, uh, you will see that even Nuama Private, theoretically, the profit would have grown by 20-25%. Correct, 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 correct. I understand that. That's perfect, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Also, third, sir, uh, sorry? Third, there is one more thing. Third is right. that 
if you look at the way uh, as i mentioned earlier in my call the way we had provision for variable cost last year it was skewed in q3 q4 so h2 right. was fairly higher than h1 whereas if you look at the revenues uh, it, they were fairly consistent it was not highly gradient uh, whereas this year we have smoothened that variable so you will see that that positive also kicking in h2 for nuama private right 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 perfect thank you sir thank you so much for the explanation sir uh, my other question is uh, on your balance sheet side uh what i understand is there's a lot of like uh, bank balances which have like spiked up from march 20 march 31st to this quarter our cash balance bank balances up 4500 crores and uh, there is some liability and debt security i just want to understand which part of this uh, which part of the business is it relating to and whether this is steady state or there is going to be some change with respect to this uh so i'll just speak a bit about it and maybe mehir can add uh our net cash is around 4000 crores uh okay. which uh, sorry net debt is about 4000 crores uh, okay. rest of it is cash which is related to client margin money and corresponding security so it's it sits in the balance sheet but it's not our money uh we have about 600 700 cro- crores of excess cash and we are right now deliberating on our dividend policy and uh, what to do with that because uh, uh, if you un- understand in the context of nuama we are just a two and a half year old independent entity and in last two and a half years this was the first time we went into the markets and started borrowing and it, before that we never had any independent borrowing so we conserved cash because in the last two two and a half years there were a lot of rules which also changed around margining for institutional clients and for individual clients so we wanted to conserve cash but i think now we are in a comfortable position and we will have a dividend policy and we will come back and disclose to the market soon so some amount of this cash will go down but that excess cash which you see is actually not our cash it's margin in the exchange and corresponding client money correct correct so uh, if i were to look at novama as the company alone and not have any client book debt or cash or whichever you are saying your net debt is about 4000 crore so that would put your ev at today's market cap of about 10000 crore market cap plus 4000 crore net debt to so 14000 crore ev is uh, that the right way to look at it maybe that's a fair way of, this is mehir here that's a fair way of looking at it all right all right thank you mehir thank you so much uh, i think that that's all my questions for now thank you so much thank you we have a next question from the line of lalit dev from equitus securities please go ahead Yeah, hi sir. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so, firstly, uh, like in the Novama Wealth business, so like there are two uh, models. One is the RA model, and the second one is the external RA model. So, could you give us more color in it, like uh, the accounting treatment and what is the like the sub broker payout in the external RMs? Uh, yeah, so that would be the my first question. So, uh, accounting treatment is actually. Uh, what we was explaining earlier is that we net it off uh, when we earn and whatever payoff we have to make uh, we net it off but i think in the published accounts it shown as gross revenue at the top and then the payoff is shown below in the operating expense but what we have produced for investor relations and all we have netted it off uh, our overall net revenue is split almost uh, 75 25 75% uh, are direct rm and uh, 25% are external wealth managers and these are not uh, uh, because you use the word sub broker i wanted to clarify uh, sub broker will be a very small component in this uh, typically these are people who in their journey of uh, wealth management had been single product distributors some would have been nf distributors some would have been insurance and some would have been sub brokers what we have done in the process over the last 7 8 years is converted them into a multi product wealth manager and our treatment with them is exactly same like the way we deal with our own rms so the entire training platform technology platform compliance framework product platform everything is available to them the only difference is that they don't get compensated or fixed compensation they get variable part of the revenue because that is their business model but other than that their relationship interaction with the clients will be exactly similar to our relationship managers yes, this is a fairly well established model in the international markets actually if you go to markets like singapore switzerland and all uh, in large wealth management outfits 
like uh, in the likes of let's say UBS and all, more than 40-50% now the terminology used in those markets is EAM, external asset manager. Uh, in India, we have started this as external wealth manager. So, so like is it fair to say like uh, then the clients on the wealth side will have some overlap between will have will be managed by the RMs as well as the external managers or they are exclusive. The clients are also exclusive for both of them. The clients will be exclusive. So uh, you can imagine like you know uh, if, uh, if there are two relationship managers in the firm, they will have right. clients. Similarly, this is a third relationship manager who's not on our roles. So overlap typically doesn't happen. Uh, unless you know there is an existing client and the external wealth manager has a very strong relationship, then we so that will be a bilateral mutual discussion on how will we share revenues. But otherwise, these are typically exclusive clients. Sure. And just to clarify, so like whatever the payout which we are making to this external our, our relationship managers that gets netted off, and whatever we report as net revenues, that is the net revenues which we earn. There is no payout further to this external RMs in the, on our OPEX line item. That's right. That's right. Okay. Sure, sure. And then secondly, is on our Nirvama private business. So just to understand, so like we have revenues from coming from advisory pool as well, apart from the managed products. So within our assets, will there be a uh, will there be a component of advisory assets as well, or just is it just the distribution assets which we do right now? No, it will be a combination of uh, both uh, distribution and advisory assets. So, is it? Uh, could you please quantify the same, sir? Uh, we will actually share, but it will be order of magnitude around uh, ten thousand crores. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question from the line of Deepak Poddar from Sapphire Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, sir, for this opportunity. So, in one of the press releases, I I, I, meant, uh, I read that we are looking to double the RMs in next five years, right? So, so what ideally it means uh, for our AUM and and and, and in that respect, our uh, revenue growth. So, I think both should move at a faster pace uh, than the addition of RMs. Mm -hmm. uh, because your current uh, base productivity obviously will go up. And if you look at our last three year, uh, three to four year track record, uh, we nearly increased the RMs by, you know, maybe about 40-50%. Mm -hmm. But revenue has grown at a CAGR of around 45%. So I am not saying that we will maintain the revenue growth of the past, but yes, it will be, uh, it will be higher than the rate of RM growth. Okay, so next five years, whatever our, our uh, if we have to double it in five years, so our CAGR we are talking about is 15%, let's say, in terms of RM. So ideally, our revenue and AUM should grow at much faster rate than this 15% that we. Yes, ideally, yes, otherwise our profit growth will fall. Correct, correct. And, and given that our uh, bottom line, uh, our OPEX growth is lower than your revenue growth, so your bottom line growth should be faster than your revenue growth, right? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, and, and, and my second question is on, on, on little on the sequential basis. I mean, last, if you see last six, six, five, six quarters, we have done uh, phenomenally well. I mean, in terms of growth, we have been growing on a quarter and quarter basis also. So, so uh, are we looking to, I mean, um, have that trend going forward as well or, 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 or some sense would be quite helpful, sir? So actually, we have not formalized the policy of quarterly guidance right now. Mm -hmm. So I will refrain from commenting on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we will be in line with the industry growth is what we can say, or slightly better than that. And if there is there is uh, marginal uh, or there is a significant improvement in the industry uptrend, we will follow that. Uh, but we are discussing internally on how do we want to guide for the future. This is our first call, mm -hmm. and maybe over one to two quarters, we will reach a conclusion, and then uh, by end of the year, we will start guiding. Fair enough. Uh, that's very helpful, sir. I think uh, that's it from my side and all the very best to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Chintan Shah from JM Financial Family Office. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for the opportunity. So a couple of questions. So first, I can broadly just talk about what is the advantage versus the uh, I mean, uh, Mr. Shah, I'm sorry, you're sounding muffled. Uh, your is voice is not coming clear. Is it? No. Oh. It's sounding muffled. Can you hear me now? A uh, little better. 
can yeah. go ahead. So my yeah, sure. So my first question is, if you can just broadly help us understand what is the competitive advantage for us for spheres in terms of, say, a tech or product or RM incentive structure or retention. And secondly, in our journey, I mean, if you could also highlight basically what all things we are working on where we need to improve, that would be the first question. And secondly, in terms of guidance, you, while you gave a broad idea in terms of revenue, in terms of profitability over longer term, say three to five years, if you could just help us understand, say, maybe how the cost to income would move, I think that would be helpful. Those were the two questions. So on competitive advantage, uh, I think uh, whatever I can say, I will say because some of the things we may not want to disclose. Uh, I think one is the comprehensiveness of the product platform which we have created, uh, where uh, the ability of the relationship manager to comprehensively solve all the needs of the clients in the wealth management space. Uh, very frankly, uh, if you look at the entire market right now, uh, there are few players who have reached that position. If you ask me between five to ten years from now, I think everybody will reach because most of the most of the peer set is working towards that. And the industry is right now, as I said, and I keep saying it's nascent, so it will evolve. And and uh, so we will have to continuously keep upping the game to maintain that edge. Uh, the second question you asked was, you know, which are the areas we are working on? Uh, in Novama Private, we are working on creating a uh, offshore uh, uh, full stack wealth management uh, proposition because now we see that ultra HNI clients do have a need to access overseas markets, set up family offices there, and I think uh, it's time now uh, to you know work on it. And uh, for similarly for Nuama Wealth, we are working on a NRI proposition and comprehensively moving to a. Uh, you know, a portfolio solutions approach instead of a product approach there. Uh, and I think in both the segments, we will leverage technology and analytics to reduce our cost to serve. I think that will become a very, very strong, uh, you know, uh, proposition from our side internally to improve the, the efficiency metrics, uh, which leads to your next question on cost income. So if you see the industry cost income in these categories, uh, wealth management typically operates between uh, 58 to 63 range. We are right now borderline 65. We were at 70. We improved by about 5% this year. Uh, asset management fully scaled operates again at 50-55. And uh, capital markets operates at around 70. Uh, I think uh, if you ask me in the next three to five years, our target at a firm level would be about 60%, where wealth should uh, be best in the industry. Uh, every year we hope to reduce by 100, 100 to 150 basis points. Asset management right now is an investment phase for us, so I, we don't look at it from a cost income angle. Once we cross 15 to 20,000 crores of AUM, is then the real operating leverage kicks in. And maybe in three to five years, we should be four or five X from here. So broadly, if you ask me if you are at 65, 66% this year, uh, clearly between three to five years, we should see, see us at 60% level at a firm level. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thanks for the detailed uh, answers. That's it from my side. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, due to time constraints, that was the last question for today. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Ashish Kehe for closing comments. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you for taking time out uh, for this call. It was, uh, I think, an interesting session for me. Uh, we will take these questions as uh, input and feedback, and some of you we will, of course, meet uh, over the next three, four months. And as I said at the beginning of the call, we will continuously improve the quality and content of uh, the disclosures which we are making. Just bear with us. And I think in one to two quarters, uh, hopefully we should be able to answer most of your questions through our data book itself. Thank you. On behalf of Nuama Wealth Management, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.